Ready to rumble? Ready to go? Okay. Um, thank everybody for going on the tour. Almost everybody. Richard. <laughs> I guess you don't want to get those shoes dirty. But uh, thanks to everyone else who went uh, on the tour. It was quite informative. And uh, I think it's a really good thing to get out and see face-to-face -face what's going on. Um, before we get to the budget amendment, we do have some important news as well. Apparently, um, this past weekend, uh, University of Virginia thought it uh, <laughs> uh, was acceptable to uh, give Mary Beth Conley a master's in education. Was that the degree you got? So we wanted to celebrate that if we could, particularly at Karen Oliver's uh, suggestion, which is a great idea. So we have a little bit uh, special celebration tonight for Mary Beth Conley. <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah. That's so nice of you. Very thoughtful. I will pass these around and uh, I'm really glad to be done. And luckily, Phil Duncan stepped down from the Budget and Finance Committee just in time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, well, congratulations. That's uh, quite an accomplishment with kids and a job and a second job and all the things you do. Oh, oh, oh. And speak of the devil, <laughs> here he comes. That's your surprise. Phil's going to, uh, <laughs> he was going to jump out of a cake, but we decided to make cookies. So, uh, but welcome, Phil. Thanks for making the effort to come. I guess you came all the way from West Virginia just a couple minutes ago, right? Celebrating another graduation. Congratulations. Thanks. Congratulations to you, Phil. Thanks for uh, coming out tonight. So we'll pass these around the room. Hopefully everyone can have a cookie. They look quite good. Congratulations. Um, why don't we go on now to the uh, budget amendment? Every time of the year, at this point in the fiscal year, we do a budget amendment towards the end of the year to um, make adjustments. Uh, this document, this ordinance has been reviewed by the Budget and Finance Committee at their meeting on uh, Thursday night. There's four sort of big things that uh, we would lay out that the council is familiar with, and then a number of details uh, that we can uh, walk through and answer questions about as well. Uh, so the, the big ones that we've discussed is funding WMATA in the current fiscal year uh, due to declining uh, gas tax receipts and increased costs for the WMATA operating budget. We have a shortfall in FY15 of $392,000 above the original appropriation of two hundred dollars So we address those through a series of discrete and identified reductions in spending or savings that have already been identified in the FY15 budget to pay for those. Second, we've discussed uh, revenues as we went through the FY16 budget development and with all, each of our quarterly reports. Um, if you look at our local taxes, we are behind. Uh, if you look at sales, meals, personal property, et cetera, uh, we're behind by about $350,000 as we've discussed. Uh, if you look at our global revenue picture, however, including uh, fees for service, building permit fees, uh, rec and parks fees, uh, we think on the revenue side that they will come in at about the target. Um, and so we would uh, not recommend any sp specific action on that at this point, and we'll continue to monitor that. And then when we report our year-end fiscal re re uh, results, um, if there's other underspending in other places of the budget, we can then assign some of those uh, building permit fees that we received to the reserve fund, which the council has created and which currently has a balance uh, for FY16 or year-end FY16 should have a balance of about $550,000. Um, two other items I would just note up front. Um, the council has discussed uh, back in your meeting in December and in other uh, venues uh, funding the lead commissioning of the Mount Daniel Elementary School. That initially was a cost of $80,000. Um, and so uh, we have put that into this budget amendment for council discussion at work session and a decision um, as to whether or not to proceed with that appropriation. I think the, uh, the schools um, were not planning to do lead commissioning at this point, and so that would be a change for them as they're going through uh, their uh, permit approval process. And the last thing I would note just in the summary up front is uh, the appropriation relating to the dump trucks, and that's at line 65 of the staff report. Uh, the council, through its budget actions, has approved, um, at least conceptually, 
uh, the purchase of four dump trucks. This is to replace old dump trucks in our fleet that have rusting out beds um, and that, that need to be replaced. Uh, the appropriation was for replacement of two dump trucks in FY15 and we had initially proposed two in FY16. We've actually purchased one so far in FY15 and we would propose to purchase three with this budget amendment, three more with this budget amendment in FY15. In other words, to pull those two uh, that were initially scheduled for FY16 into the current fiscal year in order to take advantage of an advantageous bid price that will close on June 15th. Um, so that's the $218,000 appropriation and we would use uh, five-year debt financing as we've discussed in the past uh, to purchase those um, three additional dump trucks. So essentially that's no change to what we've discussed in the past uh, in terms of where we end up, it's just how we get there. Um, so that's the summary of sort of I think we think they're probably the meaty things to discuss. There are a host of other um, items that don't have a significant uh, fiscal impact, um, appropriations of grants or appropriations of funds um, to take care of things um, that uh, are, are transfers between departments. Um, there are uh, two uses of um, funds that are associated with this water sale, and I would just note those. One is on line 55, and that is the use of $200,000 in FY15, and we're planning to use another 50000 in FY16 for the repair of street cuts. Um, in their last year of operation of a water system as we repaired water main breaks, um, they were still in their sort of their temporary patch mode on the date of sale. So Fairfax Water was not willing to take liability for those street cuts. That's embedded in the sale agreement and we set aside funds out of the sale proceeds to take care of those. This would simply appropriate those funds as we had planned to do. Um, it does not come out of the council's capital reserve. Um, this is actually extra sale money that we had planned and already set aside for this specific purpose. Uh, this will simply appropriate it. And then at line 62, there's a $110,000 appropriation uh, for salary and benefits for a water system employee um, who's employed by the city but essentially leased to Fairfax Water. And there are reasons for doing that relating to retirement benefits and things like that. But that also is embedded in the sale agreement. Uh, Fairfax Water reimburses us and then we appropriate, uh, uh, make payments to the employee. Um, I'd be happy to answer any other questions on them. I won't go through them line by line unless there's a request that I do so or that Richard uh, does so, but I just wanted to give that summary of I think some of the, the bigger issues that are in this amendment. I tell you, before we get started, Yeah, let me, I'm sorry, I, I have not called her. Let me send her a text right now. Um, and we'll tee it up for questions. Mary Beth, while well, he's doing that as chair of the Budget and Finance Committee, did you have any thoughts on uh, the amendment before us? No, we went over all of this last week, and I um, appreciate how you presented it clearly and it all makes sense um, one question you said in revenues we are behind but we're just behind the projected aggressively projected revenues right we're not the actual revenues from last year that's correct right so we're still growing we're just not growing at the rate that that's right. had been predicted and it still could change but that's where we are right now that's where we are right, right. now Okay. Any other questions or comments from anyone? Okay, this is good. Um, Ms. Oliver? I just um, wanted to be sure that people thought about the implications on the revenue shortfall of taking the building fees to cover the other local tax, the local tax that's falling short. Because that is money that would normally be put into, be set aside, right, for future inspections. That was the plan, yes. 
so just to follow up on that, is there enough money to do future inspections or what, what happens? We established a baseline of about nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and that was a pro that was based on um, having three years of money available to uh, fund building inspections after the you know projects were in the process of being constructed. Um, we used 370000 I believe, for the FY16 budget. It leaves a balance of a little over 550000 um, The thought was to, uh, wherever possible, if there was extra money, to put it in there just to make sure that we had enough to cover inspections in the future. So are you pulling money out of inspections? So where's, so you're putting, you're taking money from fees that were generated and putting it where? In terms of the overall city's fiscal year-end results, that would be counted as revenue. So, um, so you're taking 90 grand of revenue and putting it where? Or 91 grand? Well, we're I'm appropriating 90,000 of the FY15 revenue for that position, yes. And it's going toward two inspections, right? Yes. It's for an inspector position. Okay. So the council approved the position of this building inspector and the admin in FY16 using the uh, building permit fee reserve. We also have surplus building permits this year, which we would appropriate for this purpose. Right. And we will still, uh, after taking care of these obligations, we will still also have significant uh, surplus in our building permit uh, fee revenue. Okay. So to, to kind of follow up on Karen's question, do you guys have enough money to do what we need to do on the, ex on the inspection and permitting side of the house if we're removing some of this money to pay for the actual inspector? Yes. I mean, we, we're anticipating... And let me ask a more directed question. Okay. Given that we've got a lot of development going on in the city, both on the single-family homes and redevelopment, et cetera, <clears throat> are we going to be able to keep pace with that process and how long it's taking us to do permitting? Well, what we have funded um, in the FY16 budget is exactly what the de uh, development services staff requested. And so when they looked at their workload and the inspections that need to happen in FY16, which is going to be the heavy workload, but also looking at the FY17, we have uh, funded the resources that they've asked for. Okay. And, and that was, I mean, I mean, that's the answer to the question. That, that question was put to the staff very directly. What oh. do you need in order Got to it. finish the Harris Teeter building and the... Uh, Lincoln projects in particular with everything else that's going on and you know it's going to be a crush next year what do you need in order to handle it? And they're getting it? what they asked for. And they're getting what they asked for. Okay. What about the following year? The following year we've got the remaining $500,000 and so um, we will be good for FY17 as well. The FY18 is where the funding stream is any use of, of uh, building permit fees today possibly brings closer to the present the day when we don't have the funds to, to pay for those positions out of building permit fees if this level of activity does not keep up to pay for it. Which means that future projects will bring more development fees to pay for that future needs. Later. So, so, I think sort some of the gaps, at least for WMATA, et cetera, I think it, how staff has laid out how this is going to be the gap that's going to be filled by some of the lower than anticipated um, forecast are going to be paid for, I think, sort of in the detailed descriptions that make sense. It's sort of unclear about it. A little bit is, are there going to be any service visibly noticeable things that our citizens and businesses are going to see as a result of some of these movements in money to cover specifically WMATA and the shortfalls? 
Well, the um, the things that have been identified to cover. And, and the nature of my question is, this is pretty much wonky in the weed stuff, which I appreciate for us because that's part of what we need to do. But what's not transparent in this is what it means for um, our citizens and what it means for our local businesses. And that's what I'm trying to get at is sort of what's the what's the bottom line of this movement of money to cover the gaps. Well, if you look at line 114, those are that, those are the savings. And um, so line 114, you have 230,000 from IT services, uh, from training funds, and from a reduction in insurance costs. The 150,000 is one that if we weren't using it for this purpose, the uh, we would be using it to. Um, what, what that is is a vacancy savings because we were standing up our IT department. Uh, but they didn't get fully staffed until February. February. And so we were um, hiring them as quickly as we could, but these are important positions, and so that's how long it took us. Um, so if we weren't using it for WMATA, we would possibly come, be coming back to talk about trying to reinvest it in IT equipment and things like that. Um, the training funds are um, funds that will not be spent uh, this, this fiscal year according to our current uh, training plan, and the insurance costs is uh, the reduction insurance costs actually that came about through the sale of the water system. And that was something that was very hard to budget for and the reduction from VML was, was more than anticipated. So those are all, uh, those, those last two are low impact. The contingency reserves, I would argue, are precisely for this type of reason, an unplanned contingency like uh, WMATA. Uh, then the last one, CD&E, um, also do not have direct impacts. Uh, they're either vacancy savings in the commissioner's office, an election that will not be held because there is no primary, and, um, and savings from the clerk of court. Okay, any other questions or comments? Um, okay, otherwise, should we move on? I guess it's Tony Jones coming down. <laughs> she, she sent me a note back that she, she's on her way, and, um, um, do you want if we don't have any? Do you recall at the meeting last Friday that uh, unfortunately I couldn't attend? Uh, what the what the issues were that will be coming before us? Maybe we could just clear sure. up some. I'll of them speak for her, even though it's hearsay. I uh, unless anyone objects. And when she arrives, she yeah. can speak for herself, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so here's what she said, as best I can recall, and why it was there as well. But I think what she's saying is that at this point in time, it's very difficult to um, make this project lead silver certified because that would entail redoing plans and other things which would slow the project down. And so um, it sounded like they were not supportive of making this a lead certified building at this point because they don't want to, they feel like there's a possibility of delays and um, they don't want any delays. I think they're shooting to, to have this already, I think by October, is that your recollection? So um, that was my recollection of the position. I don't want to speak for them, and but that's the gist of what I recalled from the meeting. <clears throat> well, you know, to the layman, that sounds like a plausible explanation, do nothing to slow it down. But in fact, the, uh, the plans are predicated on if they say they're gonna build it to a lead silver standard anyway that uh, that information would be available uh, so I don't know how that would slow down wh whatever it is that they're doing that they're supposed to be doing it would just be an affirmation and additional documentation that to meet a certification process now this amount of money is not insignificant but to remind all of us here speak of uh I would say the devil, but right anyway, on come, on, come on up. Uh, you're uh, you're going from the frying pan into the fire. So oh, great. we were just talking about the before you go into that, and you and I had a good exchange about this publicly, and you know, I, I'm trying to get my um, head around a little bit about what's going on. I mean, at least two members of the council plus the previous council had talked about having a need to have projects that are up to a certain level of rebuild, et cetera. 
um, be LEED certified. And we made that clear in a policy. We also encouraged on numerous occasions the school board to adopt it. They chose for whatever reason not to. Then on this specific project, I know that Dan and I publicly talked about it numerous times about trying to get this thing LEED certified, understanding that there was costs of about 80 grand. Nowhere was there an issue of, well, it's going to delay the project. So what I'm trying to understand is it now going to delay the project because people are just not listening? Or was it because of something with the engineering? Or what it is? Because if it's an issue of people aren't hearing that message, then I would encourage the council and school board to take a more affirmative step towards environmental and lead issues. I simply cannot understand nor do I accept that we can ask developers and our business community over and over again to meet certain standards of, and I'm not the environmentalist guy in the room, to meet certain environmental standards and hold them to that level, but then we can't as a city hold ourselves to that level. It's just sort of not, it, it just seems like not the right thing to do. Why don't, before we, so before, I mean, this is really Dan's area that I'm treading on, but I, I just wanted to lend support to whatever I hope Dan's going to say from the guy on the council who's not like the environmental guru, but some somebody who's just speaking out of equity. And, you know, bottom line for me is if we're asking the business community to do it, we should be doing it ourselves as sort of leaders in the community and um, leading that charge. So before uh, well said, I appreciate that. So before, if we can, just for a moment, take a step back because you just walked in the room, and I took the liberty of speaking for you um, of what I thought came out of our conversation, our public conversation last Friday, about concerns you had about trying to do lead silver certified, and so I tried to parrot what you had said earlier. But before this conversation goes too far down the tracks, if you can, why don't you address? the issue of whether Mount Daniel can be lead certified, silver certified, and what your issues are with doing that, and then we can have comment, kind of response to that, if that's okay. Right, and I did follow up again after the meeting Friday just to go back and ask the construction team, um, same answer again today, that it, it's too late in the process. Um, Tony, I'm sorry. It, No, I actually stood before council and said this back during the budget, probably a month and a half ago, um, and I also messaged this back in December. But you know, part of the challenge was in December, and I was there the night you were discussing it. I heard there were some people. There was no vote taken. There was, yeah, we would really like for the schools to do lead, um, and and on one of those evenings, I actually went up to the mic to make sure you understood that what the school board had been dealing with, and you know, when council put that policy in place, it did give the school board. Um, the ability to say we're going to build a lead silver but not pay the additional funding so that we're not giving up school programming for children in order to have the plaque and that's where we were and in December I needed a firm decision from council but it was also a very difficult thing for us to be dealing with hearing that we wanted a flat budget from the school board which means no teachers and no buses or any of that but now we want to take almost a hundred thousand and spend that on lead that that was not something that as a school board super, or as a superintendent that I would even have the leeway to change and at no point was that brought to the school board that we were going to be able to afford that when we were trying to struggle with how we were going to afford teachers so that's part of that issue and it has not I mean this is we've talked about this it's been part of the CIP it was part of the very first the RFP for Mount Daniel specifically said we were building to lead silver uh, White was on that committee Dan was on that committee on the review committee so, so we all knew that so again I'm not gonna channel Dan again um, on this but it sort of troubles me that we're on a mindset that lead has nothing to do with kids because the last I checked we all live in a community where green is a sustainability issue that affects air quality, that affects everything else that we do as a community. So to say sort of it's separate, separated from um, kids and children, that's not how I understand environmental but issues. But that's not what I let said. Me, let me finish, Tony. So, so We're building to lead silver. So I just want to kind of get behind what, you know, whatever's going to happen to this is going to happen to it. But we're now looking at possibly redeveloping a high school that's next to, um, you know, 
a major transportation hub which has its own environmental challenges and we're going to build you know probably outdoor space etc we need to be sensitive to the environmental issues and you know maybe it's not green but i hope that the school board and the council look at those environmental issues because it's going to be clearly an important issue for the kids who are going to be at that school to make sure that it's a safe environment and that we're building it into a wider community um, standard of environmental protection. So I just think that we need to think through um, where we're at with sort of the environmental issues and all get on the same page. I know that councils and adopted a policy and if we need to have a joint meeting with the school board on, you know, how do we bring this into harmony? I just don't want to have this conversation, you know, a year from now or two years from now when we're talking about the high school. And we're on the heels of that with the RFP, so the timing is right to have that discussion, not sort of when things get moving and then we get told it's like too late or it's going to cost, you know, a gajillion dollars to do something. So I want to have that discussion now, especially given that that project is in such proximity to environmental issues, meaning, you know, major traffic corridors, major, you know, mm -hmm. smog and and I think the school board really appreciates that. I, I really do. And I <clears throat> just point out, the school board's asked for the last two years to start the CIP process um, in September and really wanting to start it early. Um, and not only that, but again, with this RFP, the RFP went out a long time ago, long before we were talking about this December deadline, and the RFP was issued knowing we were building to lead silver. That wasn't a change, but I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that if the school board, if it wasn't a financial issue, we would have been paying for commissioning. I, I hear you, Tony, but I, what, the reason why I stopped you, just not, not to be rude, but I, I think it's sort of a false choice, not, not one that one as one council member I would support between you know, school programming and environmental issues. I think that's just a false choice. I don't think we need to make it, and I don't hope we don't have to frame the question that way. At least I wouldn't, and right. I hope we wouldn't. Well, I, I think I just... they're both, both equally important, and given the choices, you know, I think I've been pretty clear, at least with the last budget, I would end up probably supporting both within the reason. Right. And I just it... don't believe in making those kind of sort of what I view as sort of let's put these in Hobbesian choices and we know which way they're going to come out. I don't, and I don't, and I don't we fully wanna, respect I don't want, that. Let me just finish. Yeah. I don't want to frame the discussion that way and I don't want to frame it that way on the high school because that's what's coming next. And I think, on the, again, I mean, we support LEAD, and I think everybody on the school board um, would love to be in that direction, but, but we, are building, we, are building to, we are building to silver. So we have not given up anything, we feel like, for our children. And, in fact, that $100,000 isn't being invested in the building. We've made bigger windows than we would have made. We've, we're doing lots of things in this building. And, um, you know, the one comment that they gave me back today was that, we cannot now go back in. We're at 95% on our design. Uh, we need to be in demo right when school gets out. Demo alone is a huge part of, of LEAD. And so, I mean, we have to, and that's why I'm here tonight. It's not so much to debate the issue. I think all of us hope for the high school that we will have a premier high school that is LEAD certified. And what um, you're telling me is that uh, regardless of your assertions tonight, that they're going to be build the LEAD silver. In fact, they're not. So your statement that demolition is a big part of this. So I, I fully appreciate the demolition is, and, and there are some requirements for that. But those are the kinds of things that uh, you would do as, as good stewards and good constructors anyway. And uh, let me just re remind the group here that uh, it's not $100,000, it's $80,000. It's more so than that now, actually, Dan. Maybe. Well, it's $80,000, and it's in a contract. I don't want to debate the cost of this. Yeah. Uh, offhand because you're going to find another way of saying we can't do this. I know you resist doing this because uh, you don't want to do this. And, and, and in fact, let me finish That's not here. accurate. <laughs> that's not accurate. If I could do it, I mean, that's why I went and spent well, all you weekend know, I working have to on agree. it. Okay, let's, just, let's have one at a time. Everybody gets their turn, but a fairly brief turn, and then we'll turn it back over. But let's not have any more interruptions if we can, vice, both ways. Everybody. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. So, in fact, if, we, if you had not submitted... Um, in, in last fall to Fairfax that, that in FY16 you would be doing essentially all the things that would be required under Lead Silver regardless. So you would be paying for this or someone would be paying for this and it just means quite frankly that they would need to, to do the energy modeling which is if they're going to build to Lead Silver they would be doing that regardless of whether they seek the certification or not. And there's documentation. I certainly agree with that. It's necessary for the process, but you should know if your construction team hasn't told you this, 
that the certification itself is less than $5,000. The certification itself is less than $5,000. Don't, don't interrupt me, I'm not done yet. So you do the energy modeling, and the biggest part is the commissioning. The commissioning is what saves you the money, and Fairfax would require that if you had submitted it now as opposed to last fall. So we're building a building that's essentially obsolete when you open the door, and you're fine with that from just listening to you. They're gonna build to the standard, they're just not gonna certify this thing. Study after study has shown that commissioning, which is 55,000 at cost, pays for itself within five years. Because any building, as soon as you open it, <clears throat> if you don't test it, if you don't commission it, there can be things wrong with it. And it encumbers the design build team to fix those things. So it operates to specs, so it operates to the kind of calculations that they would be doing if they are building it to lead silver. So I don't really understand this. I'm going to leave it open-ended uh, with, with my question here, which is when you assert they're going to build a lead silver standard, but they're not going to certify. What does that mean? As Joan Kelsch from Arlington said, I would think that as an informed public, informed public officials, that you would want to have third-party verification. Your turn. And you know what, I, what I'm going to suggest, actually, Mayor, is that I think I just need to send a memo with all of the why we can't certify, because I think debating tonight, we're not going to get anywhere. What I'm here to share is that I can't do lead, according to my ent entire construction team, without resubmitting um, our plans. We already have our subcontractors have their bids. We would have to actually do change orders to the subcontractors. It would put us off schedule. We can't afford to be off schedule. There is no cushion on this project. It's already set. The, the opening date is October which is the official date I need this construction team to be almost two months early and that alone is a big challenge and that's that's where I am I have no cushion on this project and so I mean I'm here tonight to share that I'm trying to be as respectful as I can I understand it's a passionate topic but I will put it in a memo in writing and then that will be you know on on the public record because I, I don't know anything else to say other than we I cannot do the project I mean I can't do it so, so to a fair point not that I necessarily agree with um, dr. Jones's assessment of the conversation um, as far as sort of where the council was on this but perhaps it needs to be clearer so I'd like to gauge sort of this debate again not necessarily on Mount Daniel but as we start looking um, at other projects um, involving the schools I know again that we've adopted our policy so I'm going to ask two questions um, one is um, why if you can pass this to Carol to find out is how expansive we can make the council's policy to include school buildings as part of that and two um, if we can't take that action ourselves because we've tried to have the discussions and apparently we're going on a merry-go-round on it and we're being placed in these sort of um, Hobbesian choices which I think are false um, and if we can't sort of adopt that policy, which I'm happy to, you know, say on this one, it's not about just education, but it's about environmental issues. So I feel comfortable enough diving into that about how we do buildings, frankly, because I don't think it's an educational issue, but I think it's a community-wide issue that, if permitted by Virginia law, we should take up, um, if that's assuming we're allowed to. And two, if we are, for whatever reason, not able to do that, whether council would be willing to send a letter to the school board encouraging them um, very strongly to adopt a similar policy to what we've had and not buy into this Hobbesian choice issue because I think the council has been fairly clear that we're willing to support within reason budgetary requests. So I don't think we need to get into, well, this is going to cost educational monies, et cetera. So that's sort of where I come out of this. I just, I mean, I don't want to necessarily go around and around on, on the issue before us, but think about not having unclarity as we take on major upcoming projects and talking past each other, but trying to get all on the same page. And if that means going unilaterally on this environmental issue, um, I'm willing to kind of do that, assuming that the law permits us to do that. Because again, I don't view it as an educational issue, but one that's um, broader because we're talking about environmental issues and ultimately the council is going to have to approve the funding for those buildings at the end of the day so th and just to be clear on that since you know others are in the room this is not about taking or diving into areas where the schools traditionally are and that's how we go about core teaching etc which is where the school board is but about you know buildings and construction 
et cetera, outside of you know how big the classrooms have got to be, because that's not what we're talking about. It's not what I'm proposing we dive into. Okay, before I hear from others, and there may be some others who want to speak to this, just for our own purposes, and this obviously is a time-sensitive issue for probably everybody at the table, is it possible maybe you could have your memo by, I don't know, Friday or something like that? Is that... Yeah, I just need to put this in memo form for you because they addressed why it's too late, why it's not recommended, and kind of what the silver lining is. And one of the recommendations they had is that if there really is another eighty or $100,000, they would love to reinvest that back into um, more green elements in the building. So I will put that in a memo form for you. Okay, by Friday. Sure. Great. Thank you so much. Mr. Duncan, did you have a comment? Look like you wanted to speak. Um, thanks. Um, uh, what you said about the budget implications of, of the LEED certification, I do remember when we discussed this back a while ago that uh, it was seen as a sort of, uh, well, we could spend X on LEED certification or X on teachers, and in a constrained budget year, uh, that was a choice that fell on the side of compensating uh, teachers' the educational program. Uh, as it turned out, as we all know, uh, the school board budget was fully funded and so I guess my question is at line 45 here in our documents it says that there's an additional ninety three thousand one hundred dollars in developer poppers not yet budgeted which could be used for this lead silver commissioning purpose so I, I just number one want to understand that notwithstanding whatever issues of timing there may be there's no financial impact on the educational program if we uh, did lead certification of Mount Daniel, and I should have prefaced my remarks by reminding everyone that I've always been for the biggest and best Mount Daniel that we can build, as you know. Um, and so if there's no budgetary implication, um, I guess I would ask, rather than, you know, get a, get a memo up, I mean, you can get a memo up if you want to, but I, I really would like, uh, you know, a, a conversation just face-to-face uh, -face with uh, the folks involved in the project and, and just a sincere, uh, you know, discussion of, look, this is an important priority for the council. Uh, we've made that very clear. Mr. Brook is correct. Mr. Z is correct. Uh, we understand that uh, earlier in the process there were some budgetary issues. Uh, we seem to have hurdled those by a 4-3 vote, and uh, we would really like uh, to lead silver certify this building it's it's symbolic i suppose i mean to some degree uh, but a lot of things we do are symbolic you know we fight over uh, fractions of a penny on the tax rate for symbolic reasons i mean to me this is a symbolically important step to take so that our community can um, you know count itself in the ranks of the communities that go to this effort and and i'm not sure where this falls on the voting spectrum, but uh, I, w I would like to vote for all these uh, items in this uh, budget supplemental, as we discussed at the meeting on Thursday night, but I, I, I would uh, not be prepared to vote uh, for uh, this item, uh, for, the, for the whole item, unless we can uh, pull this item out and, and resolve it. Um, in, in a manner that would enable us, I hope, to lead Silver Certify for a cost of $93,000 uh, that would not affect the educational budget. Now, I understand that there's some timing issues, and perhaps after we have a long discussion, those will trump everything, but uh, I, I would like to have the opportunity for the, the folks involved to understand that this is an important priority for the council, and we would really like to see this done for this building. Thank you. Any other folks who want to speak to this matter? Ms. Oliver? I, I guess I'm just a little bit confused about how we build to a LEED standard, but yet have to start all over again if we want to get certified. I, I, don't, under, I don't understand that. 
we should have had a commissioning agent when we when we started this and so what happens is all the way along when they're looking at our plans they're working through um, exactly all of those elements of the building we're paying for somebody to be on site and checking those things what we're trusting right now is that our construction team is using the scorecard they're doing everything they need to do but we're not paying for the additional commissioning we're already halfway through the project for where commissioning would have started and where we would be now we're at the midway point um, the other the other big component is that our subcontractors would have been bidding um, knowing that they're having those lead that they have to pay for that commissioning as part of their subcontracting to come and check their work instead it's our our construction team that is actually doing that um, that's part of the timing issue and I understand again that um, the City Council really wants this but I have to say I don't even know what's on your agenda I don't know what item we're even referencing so from the disconnect I, I mean I knew that I was here tonight just to express about lead but I don't even know what the item says so it's a budget amendment I thought you all talked about this on Friday. Wasn't there a gang of however many people are yeah, in this gang? Well, it's a gang of eight, but there are two of, or three. Right. So. And I was, three. I was invited to come in just to share where we were. I didn't really realize that there was even a, a budget amendment. And normally I do check your agendas, but once budget gets over, I don't, I'm not as regular. Um, but no. Tony, there's no commission up front. The commissioning <laughs> happens at the end. So I don't know where you're getting your information from. I, I don't want to accuse you of being creative with uh, information, but... Uh, Clearly, uh, from someone that knows how it gets done, you're not really answering the question fully. And, and I will, I'm certainly not um, an expert at that by any means. I'm sure that you know more. What I can tell you is I can, you know, give charts and graphs and it, they've tried to give me as much as they can so that I'm not paying a team to be here tonight. It is expensive, um, but I will do that if I need to. Um, they have, you know, notes and charts and graphs that show where it should have started. Uh, where we are now so I, I can share all of that with you uh, again part of it right now is that we are on a very very tight timeline we do not have time to resubmit anything we don't have time to resubmit to Fairfax County we do our 2232 uh, on no June 18th. submission required to Fairfax County for lead certification it's an internal process that happens with the credit right we haven't even filed with Green Council we don't do that if we're not going through it and, and again our lead architect was actually on the board for the Green Council and helped make this decision based off the budget we were working with um, looking at our RFP we did really explore it that was an ad alternate for us um, and and it's not that anybody was against actually going through commissioning and they are keeping the scorecard we feel like we're gonna have a great healthy building for our children um, but that's where we are on this project and again it was back almost well gosh at least a year and a half ago in the RFP and there were people sitting around this table that were there with us and part of the process and we all knew that it was in the RFP and we spelled it out so I, I think just my sense is that we're gonna keep going around uh, but but again I have to say I'd, I'd be remiss in saying there were several council members who were pretty clear on this issue I was clearly led to believe that the issue was one of money which was left open for discussion and there was not an issue raised about timing etc so now we're hearing, now that we've sort of gotten the money issue solved, that now it's an issue of timing. And what I'm hearing from just hearing, you know, Dr. Jones and Dan is that, well, maybe there's an issue of timing, maybe there isn't. So if we can sort of get a direct answer to that, I think that would be helpful. And then two, I, I do, and we don't need, I don't want to debate it as nauseum tonight, but apparently there was a mis or disconnect between what the expectations were and how that didn't get carried over or implemented or clarified. But I don't want to relive that. So whatever we need to do, which was sort of the second piece of that about what guidance are we going to put out either as a, you know, solely on the council front or hopefully the school board will join in. I just don't want to revisit this conversation again on a project that could potentially be larger than this and have multiple moving pieces and could be much more complicated, et cetera, to manage. Okay. So, Vice Mayor Snyder. Thanks. Rather than um, engage in argumentation, uh, would it be possible, and rather than have an exchange of memos, would it be possible, and um, Council Member Z, I'm wondering if you would be interested in doing this, setting up a meeting, Tony, with your construction people to see 
if we can't move forward. Perhaps Dan is knowledgeable in this area. He may have some ideas they haven't thought of. Might that be possible to set up such a meeting to see how we could proceed if it's possible? And I, I do appreciate everybody's standpoint. I think we've also committed regionally on lead certification as well in various documents. So I think we all want to get there. And the question is, is, is there, because there seems to be some significant disagreement in facts and listening to all of this, and that's not negative, it's just the disagreement on what you can do moving forward. Um, if, if that might be possible, I'd, I'd hope that that could be done. And then we I'm sure we want to do that. Thanks. That, um, Dr. John, something you think? Sure, that's fine. Okay. Why don't you guys plan to do that in the near future so that you can report back, either one or both of you, report back to council? And it really probably needs to be this week. I mean, that is the sort of timing that we're on, and so I'll reach out to, to Councilman Z. <laughs> Yeah, I think that'd be yeah, great. We can, and then we you can, can carve out the time. And then you guys can report back to us, and then we can make a decision to this maybe coming up very soon. And, and secondary to that, because that's the immediate issue, certainly, I, I'd like to just make sure that we don't have this crosstalk or misunderstanding again. So I'd like to make a formal request now. Wyatt, if you can pass this to Carol to figure out sort of what our authorities are as a council. And then, two, if we can't do some you know action as far as when it comes to school buildings about whether they're green or not, whether uh, the council would be supportive of sending a letter to the schools encouraging that they do that and not putting us in a Hobbesian choice because I don't think that's that's it necessarily needs to be framed that way. Okay. Is there anything else? We ought to probably wrap up this discussion. I think we beat this horse pretty good. But it's good. People feel passionate about it. And it's an important issue for the city and for our leadership in the area. And we have won regional awards on energy efficiency and, and environmental issues, sustainability issues in the region most recently, just several months ago through Council of Governments. So it is an important topic, but why don't we try to get uh, complete information later this week, then we can take action either next week or the following week on whatever we need to do or however the outcome of this. And I know you've got a second point, which I agree is an important issue. Well, let me be more clear about it. I think and, you have and, been clear. And, I get, no, I get no, it. and about sort of how it ties in, just so the count. And again, I'm not the green guy on this council, but when we talked about, and I go back to, you know, our, our sort of kickoff to this council about one of the goals that we wanted to set was being a sustainable, walkable community. And if green and sort of the only standard or the only real game in town is being LEED certified with some of the construction projects that we're taking on isn't clearly a part of that, then we're not meeting sort of what we started talking about as a challenge to be environmentally and walkability friendly because they all kind of go through that same concept. So that's why I'm sort of making this a point. And this is kind of why I want it to be a little bit of a, of a focal point on this because I'm not the green guy. But as, guy, as, as a person who just thinks that buys into the pedestrian friendly, walkable community, the environmental piece of that component is really important. So that's why I'm being sort of, you know, a sharp end to this a little bit, if you will. Okay, thank you. Um, unless there are anything I could see, there is something. No, I, I just, uh, um, uh, Thursday afternoon or um, Friday morning. So we do have to take action on this budget amendment next week, right? Monday. Monday. So Tuesday. So we'll try report back to council hopefully the, the conclusion of your meeting and offer some guidance to us and then we'll figure out what we need to do and whether some element of this is pulled out or whatever we might need to do depending on what the outcome of your conversations are okay well thank you very much for coming tonight we appreciate you heading all the way over here just for this and uh, uh, anyway okay let's move on now we do have a closed session coming up here shortly are there any council comments schedule issues Ms. Conley um, Memorial Day is Monday What's the, the plan for council? Tuesday. We, two, Memorial Day is Monday. We're in the parade, right? Has anyone told Celeste about Memorial Day in Falls Church? Does Celeste Heath know what she's getting into if she's here? <laughs> um, but what, what is your Well, just we're supposed to meet at a certain spot at a certain time and all that stuff. Yeah, so we'll get a memo out to council, sort of all, sort of the choreography of the day. and, and um, But basically, um, and I don't, remember those exact times so I probably shouldn't speak to it um, but we'll get that communication out to you more importantly who's there... buying who who's gonna buy candy for the kids because I think we ran out are we allowed to throw candy 
Back. We're going to throw panic. <laughs> Thanks, Cheetos. Um, and is there, there's a, is there a service earlier in the day? There's the parade in the afternoon. So all that will be on the schedule. Yeah. Okay. Right. Any volunteers for buying candy supplies? I, I can buy some again this year. <laughs> and then my second question is just the Richard, budget. Richard, you, you haven't been to. And what does that mean? <laughs> We've literally. It's like a false tradition. Throwing Memorial Day. Uh, Memorial Day. Yeah. But during the parade. And we do what? Why do you want to explain this to Richard? <laughs> good idea. It's good. It's a good time. You should you should come on out. I think you'd have, you'd have a lot of fun. That that suit would be perfect for it too. So. Uh. <laughs> um, okay. So did you have another question? Just the budget and finance is on the calendar right now for next Tuesday, which is when our city council meeting is. It was on the Friday notes calendar that showed up. So I just want to make sure that that's canceled since we had it last week. All right, we will make sure that's canceled on the calendar. Okay. Okay, other comments, Mr. Z? Um, one in particular that, uh, that uh, uh, the City of Falls Church has been invited to present on uh, one year status of uh, stormwater utility uh, on the 17th of July at the COG meeting uh, committee on Chesapeake, Chesapeake, Bay water Chesapeake Bay Protection and Water Quality Policy. There you go. Um, so it would be meeting with the uh, uh, EPA and uh, other neighboring jurisdictions, and, and I want to thank Y for volunteering to, to help out presenting. <laughs> you use the term volunteer loosely. <laughs> 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 thank you for volunteering. Um, okay, uh, we got two. We'll start with Karen. I'm going to do. Um, so I just have a question about the council schedule. And I was wondering if uh, maybe at the next meeting you could update us on the probability that Mason Rowe will be coming for second reading on July 13th. Okay. We advertised it that night though, right? It is, um, the initial motion was to bring it back on July 13th. And so um, what the council's practice has been is that no matter what happens on the 13th, you would either defer it formally or you would take action. I'm just asking at this time what, whether it seems likely exactly. that that schedule will be well, kept. The, plan, the Planning Commission is having a, um, a public hearing. Um, and the note there on the right-hand side, it says they're deferring the public hearing. That actually is not correct. They will hold the public hearing, but they're deferring their action. And they're doing that because of uh, the plan uh, still has many unanswered uh, issues associated with it. So the Planning Commission has indicated that they uh, won't be ready to make a recommendation on June 1st. And uh, we're still waiting uh, on a, a couple of key things with the project, including uh, changes to the architecture on Park Avenue, uh, changes to the use on Park Avenue, um, and a host of other issues. Uh, the updated voluntary concessions also are, are something that we have asked for and um, we expect to receive this week. I'd like to do a walking tour as well like we did earlier on the updated plan so we can get an idea where things are, what the massing is going to be, the setbacks, etc. Mr. Stein. Thanks much. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank the uh, volunteers who uh, participated in Civil War Day on Saturday. It's um, quite a teaching opportunity and there were literally hundreds of people here and city staff and quite a number of volunteers participated so my thanks to each and every one of them. Maybe we can recognize them at some point. Before so, you go on, I guess I've just asked, um, I've been to that for a number of years and I, my only question would be when are you going to get promoted? Have you been a private never. for every, every time I've been there for the past uh, number of years? Never. You've, uh, <laughs> never. They're smarter than, you know. Um, anyway, thank you. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, next item, and my understanding is that the President's Commission is going to report out some recommendations on policing, and I just wanted to report back from you and the Chief, uh, Mr. City Manager, about are there any, um, any things we ought to be doing to improve our policing? So. Well, uh, we would very much enjoy giving that report to uh, to you and the council and the um, chief and the department are um, exploring these issues and having this dialogue and making um, uh, we're having this discussion about our general orders in light of the the president's um, 
uh, the, the seven pillars that have recently put out by the Justice Department, and, um, and there's a lot of really good things that are going on, I think, amongst, regionally amongst the chiefs and statewide, and uh, we're participating in that. Okay, thanks. Next item on the agenda is I understand that there's a community session this Thursday on the local composite index. Recall that if we had the same index number as Fairfax County, our tax rate would have been six cents lower, and had it been the same as Loudoun County, it would have been 12 cents lower. So there's a direct fiscal impact on all of us, even assuming that we would be net donors to the state. Next question is, do we have an ombudsman for citizens regarding Fairfax water issues like billing issues? Is there someone in the city that they can get in touch with? There's a very large multi-residential user that apparently, according to some information, has been charged a significant amount more after they went under Fairfax water where I thought it should be less so is there someone could I ask them to get in touch with you mr. city manager yeah if, they, you, if you could refer them to me I okay. think effectively I'm the um, uh, ombudsman and uh, we work with Fairfax water to answer any it's questions a, it's a very significant number of residences involved finally mr. mayor is it okay if I give a quick readout on the I-66 meeting um, we had a very good meeting on Friday on I-66 inside the Beltway with the um, head of the Department of Rail and Public Transit, the Deputy Secretary for VDOT, representatives of Fairfax and Arlington County. In that meeting, the mayor and I both expressed some concerns about the lack of information uh, about the amount of money that will be available for transit uh, projects and the lack of a good list of transit projects that would benefit all three jurisdictions. What is clear is that the decision has been made in Richmond to toll, and the decision has been made to establish HOV3 during the rush hours. What's not at all clear, however, is the amount of money that will be available for transit and what those projects would be, thereby making it a real issue with regard to what's the potential negative impact if there's major um, evasion of the tolls, either legally or illegally, uh, on our streets. So I think we made that very, very clear, and I want to thank the mayor for uh, convening the meeting and helping us make that, um, drive that message home. In response, we were advised that um, we'll get some much better data on that, and through NVTC, we'll be able to uh, come together, hopefully, with the surrounding jurisdictions on projects that will actually work to prevent the spilling over of, of traffic onto, um, onto our highways. Thanks. Yeah, and to add to that just a bit, I mean, part of what we convey to them is the request for additional uh, analysis, traffic impact analysis on our side roads, not just the intersections where 66 uh, spills in and out, but throughout the city in various places. So we're hopeful there'll be a more a detailed study of the impact of the proposed changes on 66, the, how it's going to impact the city itself. So it was a good meeting. It was very frank, and we hope there'll be some good follow-up. Thank you, Ms. Mesner, for, atta uh, for attending as well. Um, I have a few other items that I would just like to mention. Mayor, if you yes. mind, just on that regard for the public's records, since uh, we were reporting on it, June 16th will be a public meeting hosted by VDOT and DRPT on the I-66 inside the Beltway project, and it'll be Tuesday, June 16th at Mary Ellen Henderson, so it's nearby for our citizens if they wish to come hear the full report. Yeah, I think they rescheduled that as well due to our city council meeting and yes. planning commission meeting, so I appreciate that. Um, also, uh, we will be doing a proclamation for the Lions Club, which is celebrating their 75th anniversary this year, and so that's pretty exciting. They're going to have a dinner coming up shortly. Um, also, I have invited a representative from Council of Governments to come to Council, just explain a little bit better what Council of Government does, what our role in that is, and what their role um, with us, and hopefully we can set that up later this summer. So that's all I've got. Unless there's anything else, I guess we've got a closed session to move into. So. Thank you all for coming. For those of you who won't be staying for our closed session and um, for the rest of you, why don't we go ahead. Just yeah. very quickly, one other quick thing. I'm wondering if we could ask um, for staff to draft a letter on infrastructure investment to put the city council on record as requesting adequate funding from uh, state and federal sources considering our taxpayers are already paying more for infrastructure. All right, why don't we go ahead down in our closed session motion. Um, upon a motion made by council member? Connolly. Connolly, all right. Uh, seconded by council member, see? 
and passed by a voice vote of City Council. Council went a closed session pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A3 .2 for the discussion or consideration of the disposition of publicly held real property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body. In particular, consideration of the sale of property at Park Place. Councilmember Baruch? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Oliver? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Z? Yes. Tartar? Okay. Alrighty, it is going in time is 920.